Great to see everyone online. Um, thanks for everyone. You'll just see the panelists and we've got a deadly mob today um, from the Deadly Project. And I can't wait to see what discussions happen today. Now, first of all, I just want to acknowledge country. Um, I'm a Kamilaroi man on Ngunnawal country and I've uh, been here for a long time. And then I acknowledge all the lands that everyone is on today and thank them for allowing um, their elders past and present, for allowing us to be, well, on Zoom, really. <laughs> um, but we are sitting on other people's countries. Um, and if you're sitting on your own country, that's even better. Uh, also want to acknowledge the importance of giving priority to traditional knowledge and, 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 and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander custodianship of, of caring for country. Um, let's say we're doing a 232 year recovery plan for country. Uh, that's what we're aiming to do. Um, we, um, I also want to welcome any other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people on, online today. Um, thanks, thanks for coming on and um, hopefully we'll have a good discussion and then we'll um, get into it. I've got to introduce myself, um, which is always hard. And um, my name is Brad Mongridge. I'm a Kimilaroi man, as I mentioned. I'm a, I'm a water scientist at the moment at the University of Canberra, um, Associate Professor in Indigenous Water Science. I'm also uh, assisting the Threatened Species Recovery Hub and also part of the, the team as Indigenous Liaison Officer for the Hub under the National Environmental Science Program. So what we have here today is the second in a series of um, webinars. And this one, it's around Indigenous caring for country, working and learning together for species and places. And it's hosted by the Threatened Species Hub um, under NESP and our, also our partners and, and researchers that are, that are part of it. Uh, you'll see the link, you'll see links pop up in, in the chat um, and they will refer to, to what we're talking about. Um, I was part of one the other day or number one and you know that was a, a really deadly conversation around Indigenous protocols and, and some of the projects we're doing in the Tiwi. Um, we're also looking at um, taking care of country across Australia and the work underway by Indigenous communities in integrating our knowledge, their knowledge and values and priorities and how we educate the livelihoods and how we link in with Western science. So I think that's the exciting bit. All right, we might get on with this. Um, this is the bit I, I can't wait for when I stop talking and other people start. Um, Today we're going to be hearing from um, this, this project, which uh, uh, me being part of the Threatened Species Hub have seen from the start and, and seeing it transform into, into something amazing. Um, you know, what it, what it really is, is, is um, bringing Indigenous knowledge and knowledge of those species into some schools. And the aim was to, to have it bigger and better. You know, this should be, in my, my view, it should be in every school. Um, and have elders involved and have scientists involved and have the kids involved. Um, you know, that's, I think that's the exciting bit. And the, the title of the project is Iconic Species in School. And it's connecting traditional knowledge or an old knowledge system with new, new knowledge, which is, you know, Western science from a point of view. And, and it's also indigenizing the curricula. It's getting teachers to sometimes move out of their comfort zone in teaching indigenous knowledge, but not, not, but from a not not from an indigenous point of view, but they're they're, they're using indigenous knowledge to, to teach um, um, about species. That and the idea was to to look at what threatened species may be in the area and what habitats are available in those schoolyards and potentially bring some of those species back. I think it's um I think that's the exciting bit, and I would have loved to have seen it here in the ACT, um, but you know that's um. That's something for another day. We'll have to keep knocking on their door. And now I have the pleasure of, of introducing our first speaker, uh, Natasha Ward, and um, she will introduce us to the project. Um, Tash is an educator, researcher, with a focus on developing, developing curriculums that explore traditional knowledge, working with local Aboriginal groups. Um, as a research officer with the Threatened Species Hub based at RMIT, um, she has helped impl implement the Iconic Species in School project, and I'm going to hand it over to her, and she can share her screen if she has slides and tell us all about it. Over to you, Tash. Brilliant. Thank you. I'm just going to start sharing my screen. 
Can everybody see that okay? Brilliant, got some thumbs up, thanks. So thank you for that very warm introduction. Again, my name is Natasha Proud, Indigenous woman with cultural ties to New South Wales. Um, and yes, I am an educator and I have been working on this project for the last year, which has been really incredible. Um, before I get going, I'd like to just acknowledge the traditional custodians of land on which the project was based on, the Bungrung and the Wurundjeri peoples, and also pay my respects to the land that I'm on currently, which is Wadawurrung country, um, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. So this was in a really incredible project, this iconic species project. And the overall aim of this was to increase students' connections to nature and through an endangered species or species. So for this project, we worked with the Wurundjeri peoples and we developed a plan to look at the matted flax lily. So the matted flax lily is an endangered species that is native to the land and is important to Wurundjeri culture. We got to work a lot with Uncle Dave and a really big part of his push for this project was we wanna focus on the species uh, and let's focus on the matted flax lily, but he wanted us to be able to show that it's part of an ecosystem and there's connections beyond just an individual species. So this matted flax lily is really important for other species in grassland ecosystems, but also things like the blue banded bee. It's a really great food source for that. So it was really important. Beyond that kind of ecological or biological side of it, there was a really big importance on building respect and awareness for Indigenous knowledge. So making sure that in teaching in these schools, we would be able to actually allow students to develop and understand why respect for Indigenous cultures is important and to actually gain some traditional knowledge in a really holistic way. Um, and I guess that kind of leads into why this is actually important. So there's a couple of reasons it's important and we could start more at a government level and at an education level. We have made promises, we have made commitments in education and in Indigenous knowledges. And the first place to start looking at that would be the Melbourne Declaration on Educational Goals for Young Australians, where we very explicitly said that we value Indigenous knowledges and it's important to teach that to Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples alike. From that, it also built into the Australian curriculum and into one of the cross-curricular priorities saying that not only is this important, but it's important in every area of education, not just in history where Indigenous perspectives maybe potentially had previously been taught exclusively. But when we actually look at these commitments, there seems to be a disconnect between the teacher level and the legislative or the government level. There are very few studies about how teachers feel about incorporating Indigenous perspectives, but those that are out there show that teachers in the vast majority feel underprepared and ill-equipped to be able to actually embed these knowledges and to be able to teach these knowledges in a respectful way or in any manner at all. And not only is that seen in research, but it's also seen in my own experiences as an educator and as an Indigenous woman, even as a student, which for myself wasn't too long ago, I didn't see Indigenous knowledges. I didn't learn about anything other than really sad history. So it's really important on multiple levels because we want to be able to embed this knowledge in a holistic way into education, but also build that teacher confidence to be able to teach these kinds of knowledges in a respectful manner. So to be able to do this, we developed a lesson sequence looking at the Victorian curriculum, specifically in the biology areas. And we said, okay, this is what our curriculum is telling us that we need to do. How can we embed indigenous and 
Western knowledge systems in a holistic way where neither are weighted more. And this is the curriculum sequence that we ended up developing mostly myself and Ben, but with help with everyone from the project. And we decided to look at how could we actually get students to do it in a hands-on manner? So to be able to do that, the students actually propagated seeds and ended up making an Indigenous gardens. And that was a really important part of this project. So if you look at the curriculum sequence, things like seeds and Indigenous farming and care for the land were a really big focus and ecosystems. And we did that in balancing that Western and in that Indigenous knowledge systems and saying that they're both equally important. One is not greater than the other. We said farming has existed in this land for tens of thousands of years. Go off and research some of it. Tell me about aquaculture and agriculture and fire farming and any other farming you can find that's existed in this land. How is that beneficial to our native species? Then tell your peers. We also wanted them to actually learn that plants are more than just a plant that looks pretty and is good for animals. And we used things like going out to the Melbourne Museum and incursions to focus on that. So we went out to the Melbourne Museum to their Indigenous gardens and we looked at the plants beyond just a pretty plant. We looked at how they're used, how they've been used for tens of thousands of years. Are they a tool? Are they medicine? Could you use it for weaving, fiber? Maybe it was food. That's all equally important, but getting that idea that plants are more than just something you plant into your garden and looks pretty and actually have many, many uses. And then working with Marnie and Ben and Sarah and actually doing some incursions. How do we actually bake with these plants? How can we look at some of these tools up close that are used from different trees and plants and actually exploring that in more depth? And as a lovely way to wrap up the project, we had them plant their Indigenous gardens and students took incredible pride in that. And I think that was really, really powerful. Now, I can talk about a program or a project like this forever and why I think it's important, but I think something is really important with this sort of thing is to actually reflect on the success and tell you why, rather than just me saying, I think it's incredible with nothing to back that up. So you can see they were loving planting their garden and something that was really effective in this program that we got some really good feedback from was the way that we embedded Indigenous and Western knowledge systems. It came across as a really holistic and really well balanced way um, and it was something that it never felt tokenistic we made sure that you didn't just mention something because you should. We mentioned something because it was important. So that was a really good thing. Um, another thing that was really, really effective was how the teacher, really, really good was the way that teachers and students responded to this. There was a lot of discussion with teachers in the school about how it was really high quality teaching and how you know, they felt really confident after it and students would leave smiling. I'd come in every week and they'd be so excited to learn something new with me. So that was a really positive thing. And for those that had students that went to the school, they would then tell me the next week, oh, they didn't stop talking about what they've done in class today. Like they had a great time. So students took it on really well and teachers took it on really well. And from what I managed to discuss with teachers, they felt a lot more confident afterwards. It didn't seem like this really big, scary thing to be talking about Indigenous knowledges, which I think kind of can feel like a lot of the time. It was something that was a lot more approachable and they felt that they had the tools and knew how to do it. But that's some of the reflections of the program and some of the successes, and there are plenty more. So I'll pass back on to Brad so Sarah can then talk more about our program. Thanks, Tash. See, I told you everyone it was a deadly program. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks each for that. Um, our second speaker I have here on, 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 on our webinar is um, Professor Sarah Beckersey. 
Sarah leads an interdisciplinary conservation science group at RMIT and is a project leader with the Threatened Species Recovery Hub. Sarah leads the Icon Science Research Group at RMIT, which uses interdisciplinary, oh, that's a big word, approaches to solve complex biodiversity conservation problems. She's particularly interested in understanding the role of human behavior in conservation and designing cities to encourage everyday nature experiences. Um, Sarah's work and drive helped create the Iconic Species in Schools project. I know I had a number of um, conversations with Sarah throughout the whole project. And, um, and you can sort of see the smiling faces and the passion that comes through in Tasha's presentation that, you know, it is a good project. Um, she's going to introduce to us uh, what we've learned through the project. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you so much, Brad. I'm just going to quickly share my screen too. Is that okay, Brad? Can you see that okay? Yeah, excellent. Yeah, thank you so much, Brad. And thanks, Tash, for um, also a great introduction. In fact, I just want to quickly say that it's been an utter privilege to um, work with the whole team on this project um, throughout. And <laughs> But, you know, I especially have enjoyed working with Tash um, because she is, and, and Ben, the two people who hit the ground running and, and, uh, and embedded this education in the school. And I think it's, it was, yeah, it was really lucky that we had the two of you uh, involved. I'm actually really thrilled to be presenting on this topic because it's a project that is extremely dear to my heart and it's, you know, it's probably my favourite project research project and definitely my most rewarding project. As a result, I'm actually a little bit nervous about presenting, so um, excuse me if I, have, if I come across um, less than confident as I perhaps would, would usually in a seminar. Um, I've actually included here the newly minted Acknowledgement of Country from the Carlton North um, website, which is, I'd just quickly like to to mention what it says here, that we'd like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation as the traditional custodians of the land on which we teach, learn and play. We pay our deepest respect to their elders past, present and emerging, for they will hold memories, traditions and hopes of Aboriginal Australians. I'm actually incredibly proud of the steps that the school has taken over the last year and a bit to embed uh, traditional knowledge and, and culture and respect in the school. They sing a different school anthem now a uh, national anthem <laughs> at assembly. They raise a different flag uh, and they are em embarking on, an, on a wrap. Now these may seem tokenistic, but they're really important um, foundations for a school to get right in, in moving forward. So I want to just quickly tell you about what motivated me in particular to, um, to kick this project off. And then I want to give you some results of the evaluation that we've undertaken to, to kind of demonstrate the worth of the approach um, in, in moving forward. So my background, um, my research is actually mostly focused on how we bring nature back into cities. Um, and I think people are starting to appreciate that, that nature uh, is a key part of the solution to some of the unprecedented challenges that we face in our cities. How are we going to have uh, you know, breathable air and drinkable water? Um, how are we going to cope with and create habitable places in the face of really extreme weather events under, under climate change? How are we going to pe keep people healthy, happy, connected and, and stress-free? Um, you know, when we've got exponential population growth and, you know, events like, um, uh, like COVID to, to try and sort of cope with. Um, and we know that, uh, that nature can play a key role in actually in tackling and helping us tackle some of those challenges. The health benefits alone uh, are so compelling. Um, this is a list here of just all of the studies that have been undertaken, um, the now proven kind of connections between exposure to nature and connection to nature in cities and health and wellbeing benefits. And they're both physical, so you're less likely to die from heart disease, diabetes and cancer. Um, and, but also mental well-being, so improving your mood, reducing stress, you know, reducing your risk of, of poor um, mental um, health outcomes. But the thing that really um, jumped out to me when I was looking at this project was this study in the middle, Improves Cognitive Functioning in Children. And it was actually a study that was undertaken in, a, in schools and it found that kids playing in playgrounds with more biodiversity had improved cognitive fun functioning, which I think is just such a compelling motivation and could be enough purely on its own without all the other co-benefits. Um, 
I should say this is a picture of our kids many years ago now in a grassland on the fringes of Melbourne when um, having a little brother was, you know, perhaps still cool and exciting. <laughs> We know that we can cool cities dramatically. We can cool schoolyards dramatically. Uh, you know, synthetic turf and, and, and the like and concrete are really <laughs> poor kind of substrates to if, you, if we're trying to cope with heat waves. This is a thermal image on the corner of Russell and Burke that shows a 20 degree difference between being under a tree and out in the open here. I think nature in cities, bringing nature back into cities is also an unparalleled opportunity to reconnect people. I say re-enchant people with nature. Uh, kids are generally spending less and less time engaging with nature you know, as we, as we, as we move, move on. And, uh, and a program like this where we're embedding it as an everyday experience in the school is a really critical kind of opportunity. But finally, and perhaps most importantly, especially uh, in the light of this project, uh, it's absolutely apparent to me that bringing nature back into cities is a massive opportunity to build respect, knowledge, care for uh, Indigenous culture um, and, and to build capacity for, for caring for country and cities. So for all of those reasons, to me, it's an absolute no-brainer to try and bring nature back into schools uh, and, and use the opportunity as a key um, time to celebrate Indigenous culture and, and to build respect for Indigenous culture. I should add that a sort of second motivation, which is perhaps a little bit selfish, <laughs> but uh, after a few years of my kids going to school, um, I, I realised that their education around Indigenous culture and knowledge was, was not much better than the education, sort of fairly pitiful education that I had had as a child. And I felt we have to do better in this country. We have to do better. You know, why would we deny our children the opportunity to learn from cultures that have lived, or from a particular, from cultures that have lived sustainably in this place for tens of thousands of years? And so Tash described, you know, what we did uh, to kind of kick this project off. We worked with traditional owners uh, and the school to bestow a totem species or iconic species. Um, and, and through the wisdom and, and contribution and time with Uncle Dave Wanton, we were very lucky to connect with, we came up with the critically endangered and matted flax lily. So we had a few questions. We undertook some really thorough evaluation of this project um, because we feel that it's kind of key to, to kind of um, selling the results and, and moving forward. Uh, we don't just want Carlton North to benefit from this project. Um, so we, we asked some questions around whether or not this, a project like this could actually achieve a goal of, of increasing respect um, and awareness of, indig uh, of Indigenous knowledge and culture. And here's here the, just a few results. Now, this one is, is not so compelling. Um, we asked the kids if they enjoyed playing or talking with people who were different to them and if they enjoyed learning about traditions and, and, and lifestyles of, of other people and culture. And you can see that there's not really very much difference between the pre-program and the post-program. And that's because the kids were very much excited about engaging with Indigenous culture uh, at the start of the program. And what you're seeing here is called a classic ceiling effect, where at the start of the program, the kind of ratings are so kind of high that it's very hard to detect a kind of an increase. Um, and so, you know, good on you, Carlton North, I suppose, for, for um, having a culture like that in the school. What we did see, though, is that after the program was run, the kids felt that the school had, prior, had prioritised Aboriginal culture in the curriculum, which is really good. And, and importantly, after the program, twice the percentage of number of students, well, twice, twice the percentage of students actually could name um, the traditional owners of, of, uh, of, the, of where the school um, was situated, which I think is a really nice demonstration that we can actually achieve some gains in <laughs> knowledge uh, through a program like this. So next we were interested in knowing whether we could build knowledge of and connection to nature um, and, and care for um, nature and for threatened species. Now, I was particularly interested in this idea that, that uh, we could deliver something extra in terms of conservation education. Um, the idea that a totem species looks after you, if it looks after you, if you look after it, is a, is a kind of spiritual connection to, to nature that I don't think we, um, we give enough attention to when we're teaching about the ideas ideas of nature. 
Um, so this Matiflaxily is a pretty exciting species. It's a critically endangered species. Very few of them left, actually. And most of them in highly endangered circumstances um, in and around uh, Melbourne. They belong to an ecosystem that's equally critically endangered. These are the beautiful grasslands of the volcanic plains in Victoria. Um, again, a, a underrated, <laughs> but utterly beautiful and compelling ecosystem. Uh, it's a, a species that um, relies on pollination by this charismatic bee. If you think that bees can be charismatic, I do. <laughs> I love blue banded bees. They're head bangers. That's how they pollinate, um, by banging their heads up against um, the stamens. Um, and it's a, an ecosystem that has, is, is completely adapted to, to, um, you know, to, in, to human management uh, and relies on these cool cultural burns. And here's Uncle Dave Wanden um, undertaking one of these cool cultural burns in a, in a grassland around Melbourne. And you know, I think it's eye-opening to kids to understand that fire can be like this. It doesn't have to be terrifying kind of walls of flame descending upon you. It can actually be your friend and if you, if you treat it right. And I think this is one of the really beautiful kind of learnings from this project. We were teaching it at the same time as the bushfires were starting around, um, around the country. Uh, and so it was a really powerful kind of uh, uh, um, lesson, I think. So could we actually achieve some benefits to, cult, uh, to awareness and care for threatened species? Certainly before the program started, not many kids actually knew about the Mataflaxily. <laughs> and by the end of it, most of them had seen the Mataflaxily near or uh, where they live or go to school, which is good because we planted heaps of them on the school grounds. So if they didn't <laughs> know that, then it was a problem. Here's um, our terrific teacher, Ben May, who um, was helping the kids plant the Mataflaxilies in one of the garden beds. Um, there was also, a, appeared, it appeared that the Mataflaxily um, uh, was considered, or you could see that the kids would, could appreciate the ecology as well, that it was important for other plants and animals. So it was a sort of underst an ecological understanding reflected there. And, and because so much of our um, learning was really about the cultural significance of the plants, um, including a really fun trip to the Melbourne Museum uh, Indigenous Garden, where we learned about, you know, food, fibre and medicine uses of different plants, um, it was not surprising to me that there was a significant difference in the appreciation this species formed an important part of Indigenous culture. So finally, would kids care more about the Mataflaxily, about nature in general, as a result of participation? Again, for some questions, we saw a clear ceiling effect. Uh, everyone must help protect nature was something that most kids agreed with before the program was even instigated. This probably wouldn't be the same in, in all schools, but it just happened to be the case in this school. But certainly um, kids cared more about the, the, the flaxily disappearing from the area after the, after the project um, was run. Uh, and then this is a really interesting one. They agreed more with the statement, the matter flaxily has the same right to exist as people do. The richness of the qualitative comments was actually though, were something I just want to quickly pull out because it was just such a fun thing to, to kind of get into analyzing. Let me just tell you a few of the kind of cool quotes that came through. I thought this indigenous garden project was a lot of fun because we got to learn a lot about many different species and plant multiple plants and, um, and use multiple emoticons. <laughs> I never, knew about the Mataflaxily and that it was going extinct. And now I'm planning to plant some in my backyard. I think making an indigenous garden was an excellent idea. I learned loads of things like the Mataflaxily actually exists and that they are critically endangered, but it's awesome to think that our school has one of the world's biggest populations of Mataflaxilies. You know, something I didn't mention actually, which was really a beautiful outcome was we were discussed how planting plants was our only way that we can, we, that we know of at the moment to reverse climate change. And that was a really positive, powerful uh, and empowering kind of um, knowledge, I think that the kids kind of learned. I, oh, this was a very mature comment, I thought. I really enjoyed this project and I think it is really important for young children to learn about these things at a young age. Cute. Uh, this one was a bit less convinced of the long-term benefits. I feel as if it will fizzle out. It was short and a bit rushed, but I did learn a lot. I would like to do more of this and wish we did it for longer. Definitely do this next year and the year after. 
this is a very thorough response. In the Indigenous Garden Project, I learned a lot about the environment and cultures in this project, such as plant names, where the plant is from, what the plant does to the environment, traditional owners and more. I'm very glad with this project. I think everybody expanded their knowledge on Indigenous gardening. And then a really sort of interesting final comment here that I think is quite powerful, actually, and that is, um, I really enjoyed science this term. I feel much closer to our Indigenous culture than I ever have. And I think this reflected, in a way, our capacity to make science more fun through kind of bringing together um, traditional knowledge and, and Western knowledge in this kind of way. So in summary, it's rare to have this sort of detailed information about the performance of a program, but I, I feel like we actually have the evidence now to convince us that this is, we were successful in all the areas we set out to deliver. We, we increased um, respect and knowledge for, for traditional um, culture. We increased knowledge of and care for species and, and ecology uh, and, we, and care for, for nature generally. And we also really importantly increased the enjoyment of science through that bringing together of knowledge systems, which I think is a, is a very powerful message. So uh, just to conclude, I'm really interested in this panel exploring ways that um, you know, we can try uh, as, as, a, as a group and, and, and beyond, and anyone in the audience, um, how we think we could get a program like this to be sort of a bit more um, broad ranging and impactful you know, across the country. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sarah. That was, uh, that was awesome. Um, yeah, look, the, the most exciting thing for me was that um, I'm also an old school headbanger. So that's good to know that <laughs> <laughs> I love my heavy metal, um, <laughs> but maybe not in pollination. Um, <laughs> Give it a go, Brad. <laughs> um, and the last one about enjoying science, you know, that, that has, you know, been my sort of world is, is, is enjoying science and obviously where you're bringing in together the, the traditional knowledge as well. You know, you're, you're bringing in an old science with a new science and you can sort of see in the comments that that really flourished throughout. And, um, you know, those kids are gonna ask better questions next time. Um, and that's, that's the science inquiry aspect that comes through. And, you know, a key part of that was, was, set, was another thing was uh, you can sort of see is that they're celebrating culture every day with those plants in there, not just NAIDOC week, they're celebrating it every day when they see their plants growing, flourishing, flowering, and the bees popping up. Um, you know, that's awesome. Thanks for that. Now I'm gonna introduce our other panelists. We've got a, another, another three panelists who are fantastic. And what I'll do is I'll introduce each one and uh, get and hit them with a probing question and uh, they can sort of uh, respond to that. And yeah, it'll, I'll do one by one. And then, then after that, we'll, we'll have the Q&A and um, with everyone back in the, the panel session. So first of all, I want to introduce Marnie Pascoe. And uh, Marnie is a parent uh, from Carlton North Primary School. And um, her children took part in the project. And I think, were they in those photos, Sarah? Could you just nod? Yeah. <laughs> They're in that photo uh, with Marnie in the, in the background and they're in the foreground. And um, her children, as I mentioned, her children took part and she has a very famous surname, um, Pasco, um, who um, I've had um, been on a number of panels and it's sort of like hanging out with a rock star. So it's um, with Uncle Bruce. So it's, uh, it's been a pleasure. Um, and Marnie is actually a paediatric nurse and a, um, a woman with, with mixed heritage and, um, you know, she also has Ewan heritage as well. She's passionate about the opportunity for children to learn about traditional culture and the importance of bringing it, this into schools, which is exactly what this project is. Marnie, can, can you tell us a bit about what you think the importance of bringing indigenous knowledge and values into schools through the project, like through a project like this? And what is the value of this old knowledge coming into the schools? Um. Forgive me for, um, you know, my nerves. I'm definitely not a rock star, even though my dad totally is. Um, yes, you are. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> you are to us. <laughs> um, it's, it's 
It's hard to answer that question because mm. I can think of very few things that are more important. Mm. Mm. Um, you know, as a parent of, you know, a child at Carlton North Primary School, I want my children to be a generation who gets to learn the things that we didn't. Mm. Um, and I want them to learn about country and culture. It's their right. You know, it's the longest living culture on earth. There's nothing to fear, you know, here. Um, one of the reasons that I learned next to nothing about culture was that I wasn't taught it in school, which is where you do learn about where you think you're going to learn about these things. But one of the other reasons that I didn't learn these things was that my grandparents deliberately hid our cultural heritage. Um, they did this to protect their children and their grandchildren, me, um, so that we wouldn't be discriminated against like they were. Um, they didn't want their children to be seen as the bad doll. When I say the bad doll, I'm referring to a study that was done in the 40s um, where small, young children were shown two dolls, a white doll and a black doll, and they were asked which doll is the naughty doll, which doll's the bad doll, which doll's the pretty doll, which doll's the smart doll. And small, beautiful, intelligent black children pointed to the black doll and said, that's the ugly doll, that's the naughty doll. And they also answered to the question, which doll looks most like you, that one. Now, my, my grandparents did what they thought was right so that I and we can now do what we know to be right. Um, we now have the opportunity to teach the true history of our country and the beautiful continuing culture that exists. We have an opportunity to pass on the knowledge that has been here all along. Um, <laughs> we, you know, at our school now, my children sing a beautiful national anthem that doesn't disrespect any culture or anybody. It celebrates beauty and caring for country. They stand under a beautiful Aboriginal flag. They're proud to sing that song. Um, they'll soon be harvesting food, you know, food that's been eaten for tens of thousands of years. They've eaten Indigenous foods and loved them. Um, they can now give an acknowledgement of country, something that most of their parents can't. They have teachers who all along had so much respect for culture that they were paralysed because they didn't want to do anything wrong. They now have teachers who have confidence to teach a rich Indigenous curriculum to their children. Um, sorry, I've written myself a couple of notes so that I wouldn't forget anything. Right. Um, we'll soon be signing a wrap, as Sarah said, which we're very excited to do as a school community. The way I see it, we don't have any time to lose. We can't have another generation grow up in ignorance like my generation did. We need to empower our teachers and teach our beautiful, intelligent children 
it's easy to think that children, because they can't tidy their room and really can't, trust me, I've got three of them, can't take on this knowledge, but you would be surprised. Um, we need to teach them these things. There's nothing to fear and there's everything to gain. So in answer to your question, why is it important? It just is. All of the above. <laughs> well done. Thank you. Beautiful response. And look, that's a, a lived experience. That's not, um, that comes straight from the heart as well. And thank you for that. That's, a, that's um, really set the scene. And, you know, that, that aspect of truth telling is a key part of our, of going forward and healing in this country. And, and no doubt, you know, the, the students and the, and, the, and the teachers at Carlton North Primary School are, are, are truth telling to, to the best they can. Um, thanks for that, Marnie. Next up, we have Ben. Ben May. Ben is a teacher, um, one of the responsible ones to, to making this happen as well. You know, this is fantastic. Um, he's a teacher working on the project, lucky enough to have the opportunity to work with the researchers at RMIT and help coordinate the planning of Indigenous Garden at the school. Uh, during the project, the students were able to learn about sustainability, Indigenous culture, connection to the land, as well as the cultivation of a range of native Australian uh, plant species. And as Marnie mentioned, you know, they've, they've, those species have been utilised for the last tens of thousands of years. Ken, um, I'll, I'll, I'll flick you off a question straight up, Ben, um, but introduce yourself, of course, and can you please tell us what the value of the project has been for the kids, for you as a teacher and for the school? Absolutely. Uh, thanks for the question, Brad. Um, it's something that I have to be aware of, of time because it's something that I could happily talk about for hours. Um, um, I, I guess, first of all, when you're looking uh, in regards to the students and the impact that I think it had on them in any school, really what your anything that you're doing, any project or learning is based on those students and what their experiences and what their outcomes are going to be. And I think that um, with a focus on them, what was most important is the engagement. Um, there's an old adage that if you tell a student, they'll forget. If you teach them, they'll remember. And if you involve them, they'll learn. And I think that was sort of the strength of this, uh, this project in our school. Uh, normally, if, for us, this was part of a, bio, uh, a biological science unit. And normally in the classroom, as, as I'm sure many of the participants know, you know, you probably grow beans or you grow peas and you learn about life cycles and things like that. Whereas what we had was an opportunity to learn about these species, um, the four species included the matted flax, with such student involvement where they were holding them, they were getting their hands in the dirt, they're seeing these, these, these plants grow, but um, in a much more meaningful context. So I think student engagement was, was probably the, the biggest opportunity for them. Um, additionally, um, student, it, was, it was an opportunity for students to connect to Indigenous culture um, and heritage and to learn about um, the way that the land has, has been managed for tens of thousands of years and um, something that myself, I had no idea. And so um, I think it was wonderful for them to see and experience um, and, and get to know uh, the Indigenous culture of the land that, that the school is on. Um, as for the, uh, for the school, um, I think it, the biggest um, benefit I believe is that the school was able to build something to be proud of. Um, Carlton North Primary is an inner city school. Um, we're quite limited in our space. Um, and so to have something, uh, you know, connecting to what um, Sarah was saying about the importance of nature, having something in the school where they can go to and see and, um, and experience, I think is so important. Um, and just a little anecdote about that. Normally in a school, and any teacher will know this, you build something and the kids, you know, if they've got no involvement in it, they'll step on it, jump on it, uh, knock it over, break it somehow within the first, you know, 10 minutes. Um, Whereas what we had with the Indigenous garden was uh, students, um, you know, making sure that nobody ran through it and making sure that it was always clean and, and just sort of really taking care of it. And I think that only comes from that involvement and that ownership. Um, 
I think for the school, uh, it was a way to connect what was going on in the classroom to the wider community. So both um, parents like Marnie and, and Sarah, but um, beyond to people like Natasha and, and, and to Uncle Dave and to um, just really sort of taking what we're doing in the classroom and, and expanding it right out. I think that was uh, hugely important. Um, again, I think it was an opportunity for teachers to um, learn about Indigenous culture um, and to develop confidence in teaching it. Um, I know for myself personally, that was something that I had no confidence in and, and that I've, I've sort of really developed with. Um, so I think it's it's super important that we continue this kind of project because of the benefit it has not only for the, the students, the schools, um, but also the teachers as well. Um, myself personally, just to, to finish on, um, I this project really kind of hit me in the heart when I when I was asked to be involved in it. Um, I was excited, but you know, quite nervous. But I didn't quite realise the impact it'd have on me. Um, my uh, landlord, I've been bugging for the past you know six months, asked him, "Can I dig this you know the agapanthers up so I can plant native species?" And so I've actually created my own native garden at home, and and I've sort of really found a passion um, for these native species and the, the connections that they have to land and to the Indigenous um, people of Australia. Um, it, it's just been a fantastic project and something that I've, I've really been lucky to be part of. Awesome. See, I wanted this in ACT badly. I knew it was a good project. <laughs> yep. I wanted my kids to experience this, you know. So it's, um, you can really, it really feels like there's a, there's a lot of momentum there and I suppose it's... It's, it's an ongoing it's an ongoing progress you know those plants will always grow if you plant them and care for them and you know you, you mentioned that the kids have ownership and they they care for it and you know Tash mentioned it earlier that you know these kids were seeing it as their garden and you know they were they were getting a lot out of it and I think that's 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 um, you know that's part of part of the benefits of it you know and then obviously learning more and asking more questions and you know I think it's um, a great project thanks Ben all right, our lucky last panel member is Anne, and Anne is uh, currently the Manager of Biodiversity Knowledge and at the Victorian Department of the Environment, and she was part of the team that helped fund the project back in the day. I think Rachel and I went down and had a meeting with you, and um, Sarah and Georgia, I think, were, was in the room. So it was um, that's when we first heard about it and saw it, and then there was uh, money on the table, which is even better. Um, Anne, could you tell us from your perspective, why was it seen as a priority to invest in a project like this by the Victorian government? Over to you, Anne. Yeah, thanks, Brad. I guess um, in Victoria, we're, you know, we're really wanting to continue to work and support traditional owners, supporting their self-determination and recognising their ongoing connection to country, their obligations and their role in managing country. And... And we need to keep, if we're going to um, achieve that and if we're going to support conservation of species, we need to be able to walk together um, to be able to move it forward. And, you know, that will help us ensure the health of country, the health of people. Um, and we, we're kind of hearing from traditional owners, you know, we try and work with them quite closely, particularly, you know, thinking about managing biodiversity across the state. Um, culture and biodiversity are in, in, entwined. Like they're the one thing. You can't separate them. Um, but we do. And so, you know, really trying to find um, unique opportunities like this to be able to connect those things together um, and to be able to share. And we need to think about innovative ways that we can do that, um, both, you know, on ground management, but also to encourage, um, you know, young people and others to, to, to support conservation, to support healing country um, and traditional owner aspirations. So I think this, this type of activity, you know, education in schools with young people, kind of bringing together elders and, and young people together, it really provides that opportunity to be able to do that. It's kind of, in some ways, it kind of builds a sense of awe. It's kind of taking that learning beyond, beyond a particular species um, into, I think other people say, like into thinking about the ecosystem and what that means, into thinking about culture um, and, and how things relate to how you might use them or, or how they might impact you if they're not there. Um, and, and, you know, even spiritually kind of impacts of the species and how, how you connect to that. Um, I think the, you know, the interest by having young people kind of interested in, in culture and connecting to country, I think that helps kind of build respect, respect for culture and it, and it increases a sense of pride in some of the elders 
that people are recognising how important it is for them um, and that they can share that knowledge. And I think that's a beautiful thing to happen. Um, so I think, you know, all, all participants in this type of program get, get opportunities and they get a lot of benefit from it from both sides, from the, the young people through to, through to the elders. Um, we kind of hear, um, you know, experiences where children um, through education programs have been able to learn language, like, you know, Indigenous language. They go back and teach their parents and it spreads that way. Or in cases like this, you know, if they're thinking about different species, they come home and say, my animal is Wilkert, dingo, and it, it provides a balance across the landscape and that's its role. And, you know, those kind of messages are so important. It helps ingrain culture, but ingrains that sense of, of country as one, that we're part of it and that we have an obligation to manage it. And that's not just traditional owners, it's everyone has that obligation um, and it kind of helps us build, build and work together. Um, I guess, you know, it's really thinking about, you know, some of these are, there's really strong and powerful ways to connect to culture, country and people. And, and you know, when we're thinking about biodiversity, we need all of those things in place. It's not just an isolated, let's think about threatened species or let's think about, um, you know, rainforests. We need to think about all three of those things. And I think, you know, projects like this and, and these kind of innovative ways of doing things are, are, are key to help us work out a way forward. Um, and so that's really, you know, for, for us to invest, it was really thinking through, let's let's try and see if this works. We think there's great opportunities across all of those elements um, and something that we, you know, want to see, you know, further investment in through the education programs and, and others as well. Can I just add something onto that, if that's okay? Um, the, the project that was run at Carlton North Primary School was, was absolutely fantastic. Um, but, I, but I guess you, you've got to say that without the funding, it probably wouldn't have happened. Um, you know, particularly in government schools, there's always such competition for resources. So the fact that it was funded was a, a major reason of why it went ahead. So, and I think that's super important that, you know, um, I, uh, idealistically, sorry, um, optimistically that Australia wide, we've got funds for these kind of projects. You know, that's a good point. And yeah, the, and funds are gonna, get, gonna even get tighter as we move into the future, but you know, you've, you've got the, you've got the basis of a great project. Um, uh, and I, you know, thanks. Um, and for your, your commitment to the project and, and the departments. And I think, you know, you can sort of see the, the fruits um, coming to bear and um, you know, it's, it, it's great to see that we're, we're at a point where we can actually celebrate it and we've got some result, positive results. And those quotes that Sarah mentioned are, are perfect and, you know, having the parents and the kids loving every second of it, I think, is um, is um, is even better. All right, that's the panel we have now. We've, we're we're going to open it up to more of a, a Q and A now. So we've got we've got about 20, 19 questions, um, and you know, you can vote for them if you have um, one in particular that you you like. But um, me as the facilitator, as facilitator's prerogative. I'm keen to uh, keen to ask a question like, what uh, what is the use of the the flax? Um, is it you know because I've I've been I've been involved with some other Dianella species, which is the you know the flax lily, but you know it has um, strong strong fibres for weaving, um, and also I remember a story. One of the ladies was telling me that the blue purple berry was used as lipstick to make them look a bit more sexy. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, open it up for so what what are some of the uses of the flax lily tash i reckon yeah please uh, yeah yeah sorry <laughs> hi um i think you mentioned most of the uses you're really pushing my memory here um <laughs> I think from memory, yeah, a lot of the uses for the metaflexily are things like we can use it for fiber. Um, so pretty strong leaves, even though it is a relatively smaller plant, you can still use it really effectively in that way. Um, really tiny berries that are formed from it, you can use for eating. Um, I, I can't remember if it was the metaflexily or one of the other plants that we planted had, like you could eat the roots from it. Mm. Um, so yeah, a lot of different uses from that way as well. Um, I don't know, you guys are really pushing my memory here. Did I miss something? I think that's sort of, that was the primary use uh, in, in weaving yeah. and just sort of makes me think that um, in the future, you know, once we've got these matted flax um, 
you know, to sort of the right age, we might be able to have someone come into the school and do a demonstration of how they work. And I think that'd be so fantastic. Mm -hmm. Just to clarify, um, so the Matterflex was sort of the uh, the primary species, but, you know, through learnings uh, from Uncle Dave and from um, from the community in general, you know, one plant doesn't make a, an ecosystem. So we actually planted four of them. We had a, um, a POA lab, which is a common tussock grass, we had a kangaroo grass, and we had the, um, uh, the Dinella, the, the matted flax as sort of the center and also a chocolate lily as well. So there were, there's four species in amongst there, but I guess the, the hope in the future is to kind of expand on that more um, of things of different usage, maybe some um, medicine or food or yeah. um, that kind of thing. Yeah, cool. And I suppose being in an um, urban context, it's hard space is always at a premium. Oh, yeah. 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 Sarah, you had your hand really up. Quickly. Yep. Yeah, just, I just wanted to quickly get in. I can't believe that uh, you guys have forgotten this, but it was, uh, um, it can be, the leaves are rolled and used as a um, snake scaring. Oh, it? that's right. <laughs> oh, well, that was one of the other plants I really did. <laughs> Which was very, a very popular use. <laughs> awesome. All right, well, I might go to the top question and um, it's from Pia. Based on what you've seen and learnt at North Carlton, do you think moving forward, if the program, hopefully in brackets, expands to other schools, the focus would stay just on threatened species or incorporate more common but culturally important species as well? Sarah? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm going to say Sarah's probably best. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I don't personally think it matters. I mean, this, this project was partly funded by the Threatened Species Hub, so it was sort of fortuitous in some respects that, you know, the, the plant that was chosen was a threatened species. But um, we, were, we were also kind of, um, we, didn't, we weren't pushed into that, in that direction, really. Um, I don't think it really matters, to be honest. I, I feel like the, what matters uh, is, is doing it right way by kind of engaging you know traditional owners in the right way and and, and choosing something in, in the in the respectful manner that that you know is driven by the school and the traditional owners and um, you know and something that's authentic I mean you know in some respects I think when I started this project I was thinking you know bundle the eagle or something kind of majestic and really I'm cool flying in. and um, you know <laughs> and the fact that it became it was mad flexibly I was like oh what hope do we have but you know actually you know, to be honest with you, the kids couldn't have been more enthusiastic. Yeah. And so it, it actually showed me that it really doesn't probably matter. Um, you know, it was really nice that you could create habitat and have it on site immediately uh, and, and know that you were part of the solution to, you know, pr the preservation and the conservation of that species. I mean, that's a really powerful yeah. thing. And it's such a positive story that I think kids are desperate for at the moment. Um, don't underestimate how much anxiety out there is out there about extinction crisis and climate crisis and, you know, and pandemic on top of it. I think kids yeah. are just a bit kind of over it. Um, so, yeah, being part of a really positive experience like that was really lovely. So with the lockdown, did the, um, did the natives go wild or <laughs> the plants, I mean? The garden is, <laughs> yeah. is pretty crazy in there. Us, yeah, we, we have to look from the gate uh, because we're not allowed <laughs> in. But, um, it's, yeah, it's looking pretty good. Actually, I can tell a positive story on that front. It, the weeds actually have gone a bit cray-cray in there and um, because parents aren't allowed on site at the moment, um, I was thinking, oh, my gosh, how am I going to, you know, and one of the teachers wanted to do some weeding and I was like, how am I going to explain which are weeds and which aren't? This is in the edible garden um, from, from this distance. And I had a bit of a brainwave. I was like, oh, ask the kids. You know, they know. They know what's what in there, um, and they did, and they do. Yeah, cool. So they got their hands dirty again. Excellent. Mm. Um, uh, question from Mary. Love the lesson sequence um, you have for the program and including practical and creative experiences and connections with local elders. Did schools have some resistance to committing to the full program? How did you organise the planting and did students contribute to the, to the design? Um, I might jump in for this one. Um, in terms of uh, resistance, there was uh, definitely no resistance from um, leadership or, or, or staff. That's um, 100%. Uh, they were willing to be involved and part of the, the project. Um, I'd say... 
rather than resistance, I think there was some hesitation um, purely because teachers uh, felt uh, their knowledge uh, in terms of Indigenous uh, culture was not strong enough. So, again, I think that's something that's so important that we we improve in, um, in uh, with our teachers Australia-wide. Um, I think once they got into the program, um, uh, the project, sorry, uh, they started to develop con uh, confidence with it. And this was our first attempt at, at doing this. So you can see as you um, try this in different schools and, again, in our school as well, <laughs> Um, it would just continue to improve. Um, how do we organise the planting? Um, we, uh, I, I sort of answered this question um, uh, in the answer tab there. Um, we tried, to, we, we were growing um, from seed. So Sarah sourced um, seed for us um, online and we were growing in um, uh, sort of a little uh, grow trays, things like that. Um, a classroom is not, ideal um a place to grow seedlings uh just not because of the students and their care but more because of um temperature control um heat light all that kind of thing um so what we the plan from the start was to have uh, tube stock available that we would be planting on the actual day um as for growing them we had some mixed success um uh some of the ones like the the kangaroo grass and the common tussock grass are easy to grow um, we got some success with the um, chocolate lily as well. So um, in terms of uh, the planting, so uh, we actually assigned, the students learned, school-wide learned about all the species, but it was almost like a designated species for um, across the school. So the younger students in prep and year one were looking at the power lab, year one and two looking at the um, kangaroo grass. Um, so they kind of became an expert on that one, um, but with their knowledge of all the other ones. Um, so each year group actually, so each student got to plant um, one of that species. So every student put something in the ground. Um, in terms of the design uh, of the garden, it, it's sort of a, it's an, a bit of an awkward space, um, you know, trying to terraform it, get it ready for the, the species to go in. Um, but it was great to be able to sort of uh, tie in other areas of the curriculum into um into uh, the, you know the science of the garden so normally it's the other way around if you're doing um uh, you know a science lesson you try and make maths connections in but in mm. this case it was sort of a bit the other way and so looking at how um uh you know for example in my classroom uh we had students uh were solving maths problems to work out what distance do we need uh, uh, between the plants and um if we've got this much space in square meters then how many uh, tube stock do we need and, and what's that going to cost and just things like that. So it was, yeah, cool. I felt a really good experience. Mm, awesome. And just sort of a, a bit of a follow on, was there any resistance from anyone in the community or the schools or the teachers or the, or the no. kids? Yeah. Look, look, it's a, um, it's that kind of a school. Um, I think um, where the students were, really on board but I've got to honestly say no um I mean Marnie or Natasha or Sarah or anyone else can chime in but I personally felt not 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 at all zero so um I, I would hope that that's the case Australia-wide I don't know but um in our case we we're lucky I think quite the opposite really I mean I'm speaking from a sort of a parent's perspective um you know we've had the parents were so positive. I had, you know, lots of people coming up to me and um, telling me things that they'd learnt from their children, you know, things that they were surprised about or shocked about, um, things that they found amusing. Um, I've, you know, we've had parents in tears about um, how joyful they are that um, their children are learning something, um, you know, in this, in this area. So... Yeah, very, very positive responses, um, you know, that I've heard sort of at a, a, I suppose, a casual level. Yeah, and I think the key, Brad, is also that, you know, the funding that we received from the hub and from DELP um, enabled us to, and let me just say, actually, in case anyone's out there thinking, oh, this must have been a really expensive program, it really wasn't, um, you know, and actually it is totally doable to, to envisage this being rolled out and to every school, you know, because it's, it's a cheap program in, in terms of money. 
Mm. Um, but the, it enabled, you know, some of Ben's time to be to taken out of the classroom to prepare. So extra time for extra, um, uh, you know, stand-in teachers. Uh, we could properly pay the traditional owners to be engaged in the project. And then we had Tash on board to be, you know, um, able to provide capacity in terms of teaching, but also to, to help the teachers and to ben, help Ben uh, designing the curriculum and, and, uh, and you know, embedding the, the sort of, not, and, and empowering, I suppose, <laughs> um, for that knowledge to be embedded. So the funding is, is I can't understate how kind of important I think it is. Um, and, you know, that will be the key moving forward. If there's anyone out there with ideas on how yeah. we, Go ahead with this. I think it's. I think it's. I think we've got a proven kind of uh, case study here. Yeah. That we need to find yeah, someone to back us to roll out. Yeah. I'd hate to see that it was just our lucky kids who got to benefit from from this project. I think every Australian child should have the opportunity to learn in this way. Yeah, and can absolutely like that's the. This can work in any school. Um, mm -hmm. Just in, back to, uh, in regards to the costs, um, just specifically looking at the tube stock, the, the, the buying the, the plants ready to put in the ground, I think in total for something like 90 tube stocks, which are, you know, about that big little seedlings was about $700. So it's not yeah, right. it's definitely yeah. possible. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's a, that's a, a great point about, you know, it, it didn't cost that much, but it's, um, it's it's very affordable, and I suppose you had the commitment from school and, and projects, and also Delp helped out immensely. Um, and yeah, I suppose that potentially that project couldn't have gone as far as it did without that support. And you know, that's it. That's a crucial point. And just just follow, sort of a following on, I think you sort of mentioned, touched on it then, Ben. That could happen in in um, in any school. So you know, would it have you know whether there's a school with different demographics or socioeconomic status? Um, in parents or, and then obviously access to green space. Are, are they challenges you think will, will challenge other schools? Um, uh, I, I, I don't think so, no. I think if there's a, a group of people who are committed to it and uh, have the backing of leadership and, and obviously funding, then I, um, I, I don't see why it couldn't work anywhere. Mm. In fact, I think that there are a lot of schools Australia-wide where it's even more important um, to do back to what Marnie was saying about connecting Indigenous students with their culture and their heritage and history. Um, I think schools that have a high um, percentage of Indigenous students, I think it would be so important to, to roll out the project in schools like that. Mm. But, yeah, I mean, optimistically, it would be in every school. Mm. I think yeah. on that, it's really important that Indigenous students have the capacity to do this. Like, I didn't get to learn anything because much like Marnie, my family, it was a shameful thing to be Indigenous and it's been hidden and I don't have that access. But I think it's also really important for our non-Indigenous friends and peers and those students to learn this stuff because we want to break down that idea that Indigenous knowledge is only for Indigenous people. Sometimes it is. There are certain culturally important things that is only for you. But knowing that, hey, these plants here, you can weave with it, that's knowledge for everyone to know. Or, hey, coal, cool burning is really valuable to everyone and you should actually see the importance of that. That's knowledge that everyone should have access to and it's only going to be able to increase reconciliation within Australia and create another generation of people who are more than willing and want to push towards closing the gap and towards reconciliation and towards having a more equitable future for all. So I think it's important no matter who the students are in that group, whether they are from Australia, whether they're refugees, immigrant, any any demographic, I think this is such an important project and such important knowledge. Yeah, well said, well said. Um, Brad, can I just add, I guess, yeah, sure. you know, just thinking about the funding side and different opportunities, I think there's there's kind of short term and, you know, thinking about the bigger picture, long more longer term opportunities. And so if we kind of take Victoria, I think, you know, having this embedded into funding to schools, I think, you know, it's a long term and I think there's to be big arguments, you know, you have to, we'd have to write and, you know, write a lot into, into budget bids and things like that. So a, a much harder push. But, you know, there are certain things, for example, the Victorian government um, is, um, and the Department of Health has signed up to a health MOU um, with 
the Department of Environment. So the two departments kind of thinking about how do you how do you support well-being of people and that connection to co connection to nature, connection to country is part of that. So how are they implementing that? Um, and that's kind of embed trying to be embedded in the Department of Education, Department of Health. Um, and then there's other kind of short, more shorter term kind of funding opportunities through, say, environmental community grant programs that this would would fit into. Um, you know, I think there's one open at the moment with the with the Australian government around bushfire response for communities. And you know, you could think of activities that that schools could apply for for that. Presumably, don't quote me on that because I'm not part of that, not part of them. But you know, to me, you know, those kind those kind of um, small environmental grant programs are things that could get you know a school doing a project for a year or two that starts to you know, they're kind of small grants that get some of the activities going, gets gets parents understanding the program and then kind of starts to, to build the argument in their schools to, to run it further. Yeah, cool. Thanks, Anne. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Um, I've got a question from Emma, but I'm going to go to, it's more of a statement, and from none other than the principal of the school, Rachel. Um, Rachel. She, <laughs> she has said... So proud to be the principal of a school with community that is so committed to promoting our cultural heritage and native aquatic species. Our students are excited to share their knowledge of the plants within our school grounds. The learning continues as we are about to plant more garden beds with four iconic species. Our indigenous edible garden is thriving. We weeded the edible indigenous garden today. It looks great. Our next step, our next steps to include a development of an outdoor learning space with a fire pit. Um, and smoking ceremony for smoking ceremony. So you know they, they, that's that, that's the leadership owning it as well. You know, and I think that's that's fantastic to see. Yeah, and actually that's probably worth um, a kind of special acknowledgement that um, Rachel, you know, you ask if anyone was ever reluctant, and she was one hundred percent supportive from day one. Mm -hmm. um, but actually, the whole school community was, and and all of the teachers. So yeah, but we're really grateful for her support in particular. It was terrific. Yep, awesome. Uh, question looks like for you, Sarah. Thanks for the presentation, Sarah. What a great project. Perhaps an open access module that teachers could pick up easily could help extend the reach. Also, perhaps an adapted module for holiday programs. This might be a way of incorporating into areas, contexts where it cannot be incorporated into school curriculums that easily. Remember. Well, funny you should say that <laughs> because, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, COVID's been terrible for kind of trying to roll a school program out with um, no, well, I mean, traditional owner access to schools, parent access to schools, any excursions, incursions have been completely stopped. And so, yeah, we, we actually had the intention of rolling this program out in a second school, um, but we're kind of, um, we had many challenges, but, you know, one of them being COVID. And so instead, we've actually used that, the, the extra money, Tash, you could take it from here, but Tash has been working on exactly that, the kind of online online materials that can be sort of taken up and used. So Tash, maybe you could expand on that a little. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, that comment pretty much read my mind. Uh, um, <laughs> when we were talking this year, it's been really difficult because we're all so passionate about this project and we want to see it being able to be brought out to other schools. But the reality is COVID sticking with us for a little while longer. So it's going to be quite hard to do. But also not every school maybe is able to at the moment. It's something that in the future would be great for everyone to be able to. But sometimes it's a little bit too hard for schools to be able to do that without that kind of extra support. So developing some kind of online learning modules um, for students and some the guides for teachers and how they can use it to really um, support the students learning and to support their own curriculum. Looking at currently focusing on more things like really basic cultural awareness. Mm -hmm. What is the right terms to use? Yeah. You know, how do we use the word indigenous or Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander? Um, what is an elder? things like that really basic, but then also going into learning more things about aquaculture and agriculture, farming, um, and a few other things where the idea of it is it's small and easily accessible modules, nothing elaborately long. You don't want to have a kid sitting in front of a computer for an hour, but something to really just provide information and to enhance learning. Um, so that's kind of the goal behind the development of these online modules. Yeah, no, that's 
that's, you know, and I think schools will be crying out for that once the word gets out, <laughs> that opportunity to access that sort of information. Um, Fingers crossed. Yeah, and it's it'll cost you about ten grand per module. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I suppose following on from from that touch as well is about the um, uh, using names and things like that. Yeah, there's a there's a question there around the confusion of using indigenous peoples, and then also we're talking about indigenous plants. So the 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 plants are indigenous to that that place. But the indigenous people are also indigenous to that place. So there's a Bit of confusion they sort of suggested can we talk about the aboriginal plant use garden um because it's on or under in bunurong um is that is that possible rather than just using indigenous yeah so i think that's a really good thing and it's something that language is always evolving especially when you've taken indigenous languages and trying to merge them into english so something that i think is really interesting for example is australia is the only country where we call our First Nations people Indigenous with a capital I. That's normally how we distinguish between Indigenous peoples and Indigenous plants. Plants, animals don't have the capitalised I, while our people do, but we're also one of the only countries that actually do that. Um, but something that I know is really important and in language is really important, people are pushing for, is to acknowledge Aboriginal or use the word of the country that you're on. Wurundjeri, Boomerang, Wadarung, wherever you are. Yeah. Because Aboriginal just means Australia minus Torres Strait. Um, and Indigenous just means Australia and the Torres Straits. So they're really broad terms for hundreds of cultures. Um, so I think it's important to explain what those words mean and to say the difference between an Indigenous person and an Indigenous plant and animal and how we can distinguish but there's a real power in using the traditional words, using language, um, you know, embedding the, the normalization of referring to somebody by where they're from, if they're able to have that information or, you know, just using more specific terms. It's hard to remember that Australia was kind of more like Europe, you know, hundreds and hundreds of peoples living with different languages and different histories and different dream time, but we're all joined. And sometimes it's nice to acknowledge that there are differences and to use more specific language. Yeah, excellent. Good explanation. Um, yeah, look, there's a, there's a request there. Can we see the words of the, the school's anthem? <laughs> so that's a, more of a request is, is that an opportunity to see it somehow? Is it on the web, school's website or? Money, do you want to? Um, it's, if you look it up online, it's the Kutcher Edwards version of the anthem. It's the same tune. The words are different. Yep. But not like totally different. I mean, the kids totally different. adapted really quickly, haven't they? <laughs> Just the bits awesome. that could offend. Absolutely. Thanks. It's so much better. It's a much mm -hmm. better song. <laughs> awesome. Um, a question from, uh, oh, Maddie, Maddie Miller. So she would have been involved in the Hi, early Maddie. days. Um, she's uh, a deadly archaeologist and a, a Darug woman. Um, so great she's on um, online here. And she's got a question. Thanks, everyone, for your time tonight. Great to see the results. Did you observe many cross-curriculum learning opportunities? Um, I might start this, but uh, Natasha um, can jump in too. Um, I think it's actually a problem of too many opportunities for cross-curriculum learning because uh, with something like this, um, you know, just off the top of my head, um, you know, ones that we actually did, we, we um, organised by Marnie, we uh, did a cooking day where we used um, uh, particular um, ingredients in our cooking um, we did art where students were doing sketches. Um, I mentioned before we were doing the, um, the maths in the classroom, students writing, um, reading uh, on, you know, about different topics, uh, aquaculture, physic farming. So um, you can pretty much link it to every part of the, the curriculum. So, yeah, e extreme opportunities for cross-curriculum learning. Yeah, and I think it, beyond just cross-curricular, also soft skills and those priorities being able to, you know, communicate, being able to use our hands, 
all of those kind of skills that you, it's really hard to write into the curriculum. Um, I think students also got a really good chance to do it. And, you know, learning how to garden is always valuable, regardless. Uh, I am still to this day pretty bad at it. So I wish I could have had that kind of education. But it's a lot of that kind of thing as well. I thought that was really, really powerful. Well, yeah, put it, uh, put it this way. Uh, 12 months ago, I would have said I was the same. But, um, you know, I, I should have put in a photo of my the Indigenous garden that I made um, in my backyard because I, I surprised myself. Got to say, <laughs> I'd say prior uh, learning. I think the cross um, curricular nature of the program was just really vital for the richness of the learning. One of the examples from the cook um, that we really wanted the, the children to um, actually eat, um, you know, a plant um, that has been grown for you know, tens of thousands of years to, to show them that this is not, we're not teaching you something that was, we're teaching you something that is. This is a continuing culture. It's, you know, we're living it and we're eating it right now. Um, and I think that so that those cross-curricular things are really important for, for that experience, for it to be real for them. Yeah, it was much better than you know, the usual beans grown in a plastic cup with uh, cotton wool. Not that that's a bad experiment, but, you know, this was much richer and deeper. Are any of the species fire dependent? Do you know? Yeah, probably all of them, I think. Yeah, definitely the uh, kangaroo grass and the, um, I always say power lab, um, but because I can't say the full name, uh, the <laughs> common tussock grass, definitely. But um, Sarah, I'll pass on to you. Uncle Dave had uh, had sort of um, threatened that in future years, if we if our garden was successful, he'd actually come back in and, and help us burn it, which I thought would be really fun and great. Just imagine the risk assessment for that one. Uh, yeah, but you know, sorry, Rachel, hoping <laughs> if you're still listening. <laughs> oh look, we uh, look at that. It's a couple of minutes to six. We could talk all day uh, about this, and I think it's um, it's been an absolute honour to. Well, do my best to facilitate this, and you guys are the stars of the show. And um, you know, we've had a, a few um, VIPs log in. You know, uh, Maddie and the, and the principal, and you know that that's been awesome. We've had many people online, and there's still 13 unanswered questions. There are some crossover in the questions, but um, you know, I think there's um, there's an opportunity and um, to to look at those. But uh, one one quick question um, was the research hard to get approved um like ethics and things like that yeah absolutely um as you can imagine doing something with children and traditional owners was required the you know utmost of care in terms of ethics and so you know we we went through we had a, an agreement a research agreement between the school uh and the Wurundjeri Wurrung Aboriginal Corporation uh, we had RMIT ethics um sign off and then we had education department sign off so that did actually take quite a long time to, to orchestrate yeah. but it's a really absolutely necessary part of all of this um, and it means that we can now sort of as a group as as all of us as co-authors sort of publish these findings and I mean that'll be a really nice thing because a lot of education programs aren't actually evaluated and published so this will be out there um, as evidence that it kind of worked <laughs> and people can can pick it up and use it to argue for similar things in their own places yeah well Sorry, panel. I'm going to have to finish up at six o'clock. It's dinner time. <laughs> You've done well, brilliantly done. And thank you all. And I'm sure there'll be virtual clapping everywhere. Um, and uh, there's been, yeah, a lot of, lots of, lots of comments coming in now to the question thing saying thanks. Amazing. Um, oh, Maddie said VIP gammon. No, 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 you're, you're VIP. <laughs> Second vote here. Thank you. Um, look, um, thanks again to the panel and um, thanks for your time and commitment to the project. And, um, you know, thanks Ben, Marnie, Sarah, Anne, Natasha, and obviously all the support staff from the hub. And I'm just here to, um, just to, to do, my, do my thing to help you tell your story. And um, it's been fantastic. Thanks for, for allowing me to be part of it.
Well, Brad, can I please just say thank you, especially to you, for all of your support with this project. I think it was actually totally essential and, uh, and for doing the fantastic facilitating. And also to Rachel, Heather, Holly and Andrea, who have been behind the scenes here, but also incredible help through the whole project as well. Awesome. Well said. Um, when you log out, you'll also get see the option to give some feedback in the window browser. So we'd really appreciate your feedback. This helps us to improve our events. Um, thanks to you all for coming and for all the great questions. Sorry we couldn't get to all of all of the questions. And thanks so much, and hope to see you on other on other on, on other webinars put up by the hub. Um, thank you and good night.